All right. Well, I feel like I'm standing so close to everybody. Uh, welcome to the Poetry Den, where words once written on the page are now performed on stage and solidarity extends between poets and... Oh, my God. Ten years in the making, if people don't know. <laughs> Well, I might be given a prize for that one day. So, you know, come on. Anyways, um, if you don't know where you're at, again, this is the Poetry Den. My name is Pam Blair. I am the host of the Poetry Den. Uh, we've been in existence for the last 10 years and probably seven years, seven, eight years here. And so glad you all uh, braved the, the elements the cold to come and be warmed up by some uh, poetry today. Um, we are at the end of, oh, also, welcome to all of you that are watching online too. We welcome you. Um, again, if you want to sign up for the open mic, just shoot a message in the chat for George and he'll let me know. Um, but yeah, we're ending the year 2022 and, and gearing up for 2023. So, um, yeah, another another year under the belt. Um, how many people out here have, are Christmas shopping or done Christmas shopping? Done. done. I have not even started. Is that bad? <laughs> it, might, it might be some lumps of coal or something. I don't know. Like, or just Merry Christmas. Um, um, I'm a visual artist, as some of you might know. And so a lot of my stuff... Um, as is handmade stuff that has, has been given. So anyways, who's, how many new people we got? Just got a few new people, right? So, no, this isn't church. Don't pull me out. Like, <laughs> don't make me stand and give where I'm from. Um, well, welcome again. This is the Civil Rights Heritage Center. Um, yeah, um, if you want to know more, but I will just, since there's only a few people, if you want to know more about it, um, you can definitely Google it, talk to George here, um, who is always so gracious to, to do either the speed version or the long version of what happens in this place, which is um, many, many beautiful things. Uh, and so we're glad to be here. We're glad that uh, the Civil Rights Heritage Center, if we can give them a round of applause for the whole year and help us out. Okay. Um, a lot of times uh, when people do these kind of events, you know, they're in spaces that, you know, they have to pay to be in. And I think when we first started, uh, we had a, um, you know, there was a charge of like $5 to get in. And ever since we've been here, we haven't had to charge anybody to do that. So that's just, uh, it's just a real blessing because they got to keep lights on here and heat on and set up. And, and this man has to come away from his family. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely, um, <laughs> it's definitely a blessing to be here. Um, one thing that I'm going to continue to um, to talk about throughout the night is uh, that next year in March, which will take the place of uh, the regular Poetry Den, there's going to be a slam competition. So it's called the Poetry Den uh, Slam Competition. Yeah. Um, and so there's auditions for that. Um, I'll be putting out a lot of, if you, if you have not liked our Facebook page, please do, or our um, Instagram, which is poetry in at 20, 20, uh, 2012. Uh, so make sure that, um, you know, you visit those. We'll try to put some, at least on our Facebook page, I think we can do the video to, if you haven't ever heard what a slam is about, there'll be a little example. There is auditions for it. There is prizes for those that get accepted into the slam. And then that uh, event will happen right here in the place of Portion. So uh, there are flyers on the table. So make sure you can take one. You can take a big one or a little one, post on your refrigerator. Um, we need people in the audience, whether you are a part of the slam or not, we need audience participation. So make sure you can come and scream for your favorite artist or whatever. But we do need that as well as people that want to compete. Uh, also on the table, there's some some just little notepads that we gave away during our anniversary. Feel free to take as many, or I just want them gone. I bought, I did a lot of them. I still have some left, so you know they make good little scribble. You can actually write something here if you want to, um, or just write me a note, say how great I am, or pass it on. Uh, 
Bathrooms are in the corner. If you um, need to do that, remember if, is the, the hand blower still work? The hand blower still work and they have frequency. Yes, they are very loud, which will be a plus because we'll be able to know that you did wash your hands when you came out of the bathroom. <laughs> However, we will know that you did use the bathroom. So, but there are towels in there too, or, or uh, paper towels that you can dry your hands with, just FYI. Another housekeeping thing, if you have phones, if you can put them on silent, um, that helps a lot to not. Um, okay, quick question from our mind too. Is yes. The date that the school is expanding? Um, it will be March. It's the fourth Sunday in March. So it is March the 26th. And again, keep checking our age, get on our Facebook page or, or Instagram, we will continue to put that stuff online. I try to not do it too close to some of our featured artists just so we don't take, you know, spotlight away from that. So I will be gearing up for that. There's a QR code on there. It will allow you to sign up uh, for those that want to be a part of the um, slam. And there is uh, money involved. So incentives to being a part of it. Uh, what else do I need to say? Oh, how uh, this works. I call you up. I have a list here. I just randomly call you up. You have like five minutes, some, you know, you can do six, seven. You go 10 minutes, I will probably throw something up at you. Um, now nah, I'm trying not to hit you, hit you in the leg or something like that. Um, uh, just so we just don't want to take away from our feature tonight. Um, and then our feature will probably tell you about the books that she has available at the table. So have I talked enough? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I usually lead out with a couple of poems. And yeah, we'll just do a few here. Um, I had these in order and now they're not. So since it's Christmas, you know, hey, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, right? So just I only get to read these poems like once a year. So <laughs> I'll just bore you all with these. Uh, this one is called, Who is Christmas Really About? Let's not make people's eyes. Maybe if we just have a, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> Santa Claus and who is he? Is he black, white, mixed, or Chinese? In blowing snow, I, I, I really can't tell. He's always begging for money, ringing a loud bell. Supposedly, he brings cheer only once a year, breaking an entry, yet most sincere, leaving gifts under the tree. One year later, those credit card companies want to sue me. The world says baby girls got to have it. Five years later, baby boys got to have it. Teachers say he's ADD. I step says he can't read. The clause in Santa is in very small print. It says, I don't love you unless I buy you a gift. When really the gift is not about me. It's about a man who lived to die on a tree. It's about a man whose birth is hidden behind a big red suit. Maybe the red signifies his bloodshed upon the earth. That same blood saved you and me, the blood that says... I have life eternally. The blood that says I can live with my heavenly father forever, not later, but on earth as it is in heaven. That's that peace. Um, let me read another Christmas one here. Oh, Christmas, a uh, Christmas thought. You might say some of the same things. <laughs> A red nose, cold toes, driving around in circles, cramming the car into the row. Hurry, rush in, toss your money to the ringing man's tin. Feeling guilty if you won't, God won't bless you if you don't. A list of gifts, yet little money to blow. Take the price tag off, they'll never know. And what's left is Christmas season, much less than what we were taught to believe in. So smile at best, put your mind to rest. For soon, there'll be a reason to do it all again next season and then i'll read one more um just a little yeah it's called winter association it's really short 
First a cough, then a tickle. Hear a sniff, oof, now a sniffle. Look out, she's gonna blow that snow right in your face as you slide across the ice, taking the advice, saving yourself from harm with a shot in the arm, hoping the flu will take a back seat to you. Splinter Association. <laughs> One time. Um, yeah. All right, so we're gonna get going. Uh, got a nice little list here. Got a wonderful featured artist. Um, again, if there's anyone out there that wanted to read and did not sign up, let me know. We'll make sure you get on the list. So uh, we're going to start off with Wayne this, today. Wayne, you can start some luck for him. Thank you, Pam. Um, and during the introduction tonight, Pam said, we're here with poets and friends. And I'm gonna read two poems tonight, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna read two lines from the second poem. I do have friends and a dozen poets in a den. That'll be part of the second. The weeks leading up to Christmas in many churches, it's called Advent. And for each Sunday in Advent, there's a set of readings. So this was the reading for the second Sunday of Advent a couple of years ago. It's the story of John the Baptist tells the people to repent. The people come out and say, are you the one we're looking for? He said, no, ain't me, there's somebody more mighty than me on the way. A poem based on Mark chapter one. We live in darkest night. There is no hope. We stumble, then we fall. There is no path. Dark morning shadows hide truth's form from us, while heat of noonday sun tempts us with despair. But still, we hold a promise from our God and seek a path made straight by one who comes to baptize and proclaim to us, repent. We listen. Then we ask, are you the one? So he replies, there comes one after me. With spirit's fire far mightier than I. Do not lose hope. Repent and wait for him. And as you wait, have joy, for it is his plan to suffer and redeem you from your fears. One day of waiting worth a thousand years. But there is no end. There are eight billion of us, and we are all connected. Fibers woven into a tapestry with hues both brilliant and subdued. I had believed that at the end, when the last thread found its proper place, we would see beauty. But there is no end. And so we have only day after day of tedious weaving and painful boredom, along with fear. In fact, on some days, I shun connecting with you. I fear and speculate, you may have leprosy, or what if I get too close? But still, on most days, I gather handfuls of dust, a brittle, dead flower petal, with a bright orange sunset. I carry these to River's Bank where I patiently work to create beauty from beauty, a beauty to be shared. But when I seek to share, I find few who understand, few with the luxury to live beyond survival's edge. 
I do have friends and a dozen poets in a den with their promise to give us a safe place to speak. But even here, trauma betrays trust and I remain alone. One more time for Wayne. Thank you, Wayne, for being here. All right. Uh, let's see. I might go online to Ted. Is Ted ready? Is he listening? If not, we can come back. He might be grabbing a cup of coffee or something. Okay. All right. We can just we can we can just message him, but we're gonna go on to. No, I'm here. Oh yeah, all right. Ted, he's got that lean look too. Yeah. Don't run off on me. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening and welcome to all of you who are there, brave the cold. The holiday season begins in, uh, I guess Thanksgiving time or a little around there, and runs through. Christmas and into the new year. And it brings about a lot of different emotions and thoughts to people. And the poetry tonight reflects some of those moods that I've gone through. The first one is I choose us. I choose us, not because it's easy, but because it's you. We hold hands, share smiles, talk tonight away. We have it all, a bond, others envy. Even when uncertainty makes its entrance and time is spent apart with thoughts of giving up and each to go their own way. I still have no doubt we're the closest of friends. Someday you may leave me or tell me to walk away, but not tonight. No, not this night. Tonight, save your choice. You see, I choose us because it's you. The next, there's another mood that struck me. Life easily becomes unpredictable. Even when it is, some say, gladly say, that's what makes it so delectable. Life is a wonderful game to play, a banquet to enjoy, brought to our table. Others readily proclaim, nay, nay. It may bring about a harmful event when its arrival is unpreventable. Leave us with harsh outcomes we resent. This intruder makes us feel vulnerable. Now in difficulty, we will find this to cause our life plans to be unreliable. As if we are falling into a deep abyss, a dark destiny that is unavoidable. Some will state, no problem, we're capable. And whatever comes, we will survive all and act in ways that are commendable, making us feel great, standing bold, and tall, even if the future is unforeseeable. So here we are, two points of view. One claims their life will be disabled. The others say, no worry, we're able. So which of these two best describes you when the now becomes unpredictable? The last, is Steam Engine 109. Steam Engine 109 runs on the Backlands line. From my high above view, I can see the 109's crew. They do their work sun or rain to connect together the 109 train. 
hooking up cars till late in the day when it's finally ready to be underway. The shiny black engine with red trim jerks forward and its wheels spin, straining to pull tons of freight to faraway destinations, but wait. Slowly at first, then with time gains speed, sounds its whistle for crossroads to heed. Now moving down the silver track, I watched the train from its front to back. Following rails that chase the setting sun through the dark night, 109 makes its run. The rocking cars, the clickety-clack, announces passage along the track. The engine works hard for the crew it serves, up gentle grades, around sweeping curves, running along painted hills with evergreen trees, past small farms, doing its work to please. I always loved to operate this little train of mine. I was five at Christmas time when Santa Claus brought me the 109. I wish you all happy holidays and a good life. Thank you, Ted. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah. One more time for Ted. As I mentioned um, before that I'll probably keep mentioning, we are doing a poetry slam here at the Civil Rights Heritage Center. You'll see these posters that are out there on the table. Uh, you can take one, there's smaller ones and there's bigger ones. The slam, of course, a little circle. Creative, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, really excited about this. We have uh, an anonymous, um giver um to the prizes which is just amazing and um so we're very humbled by that the uh this person that wants to give back into the community so yeah there's a qr code there it should pull up a um sign in you can sign in under uh one of the times if you're not competing that's fine uh we need the audience so um i will i've been a part of Three slams, actually. Um, they can be fun and very challenging, uh, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun to um, to just be to to learn about that. We also showed a did we show that film here? Don't be nice. Yeah, we showed a film here once called Don't Be Nice. Uh, in other parts of the country, you know, slams are huge. They're huge, and um, you know. There's a lot of people that benefit from, from being a part of that and learn a lot and are able to express themselves through, work, through uh, the spoken word. And so we just kind of want to bring a little bit of that, you know, outside of what we always do here. Um, but yeah. So I'm going to bring up Deb. Please give Deb some love. Thank you. Um... So the first poem I'm going to do tonight, um, a lot of times I put my poetry on social media and this one, I don't see me doing it because the nature of the poem, I did read it at another event. And then after that, I wrote it to the woman that I wrote it for. Um, and what I learned about poetry as a result, um, because I warned her that it was coming and I put it in a big envelope because it would be triggering to her and I didn't wanna, I wanted to honor her and not trouble her. Um, and when she got the poem, she opened it, she read it and then she texted me. And the part I didn't expect was when she said that I've just been sitting here in the stillness reading it over and over. And um, so the, the gift that our words have when we put them on paper, because for me to have said what's in this poem up close and personal would have been creepy. It would have just been really weird. It just wouldn't have been appropriate. So um, I think so. Um, anyways, I just, again, thank you, Pam, for the space and inviting, and here we go. Um, Double Jeopardy. She has walked this path before. 
she has opened and closed the very same doors, surrounded by this feeling of deja vu and immeasurable, unthinkable loss times two. She said goodbye again. They both knew that it would happen to one of them, but they decided to take the risk and say yes to a love like this. Both had loved before and lost, were well acquainted with the cost, the frailty of our humanity, our mortality. Though it was too soon, it was just as they had planned. They had a unique perspective enabling her to understand. So she laid him to rest beside his first wife because she was not the one and only love of his life. They were not the first and they were not the least. Their love was grounded in empathy. Each knew what it was like to give their heart away and watch it be stolen, captured by the grave. They knew how to live with the ghost of a spouse for his company residing in that same house, but there was no jealousy or animosity. They accepted each other's past willingly. So why is she facing double jeopardy? She is no stranger to the depth of this grief. And in this case, experience is the liability. It's adding to her shock and her disbelief. Losing him caught her off guard. She had already loved until death they did part. How can she hold the pieces of not one, but two broken hearts? Like the rings on her fingers, grief is not linear. It weaves in and out circles and lingers. And now there are twice as many days of the year to remember and shed tears. Favorite things and pet peeves. So very many moments to grieve. How does she navigate her grief? The aggregate weight of not one, but two loves surrendered to the grave. And how does she extricate the bold and the delicate, commingled memories and tears of her two loves throughout the years? So now she lives with another ghost in the house, the once again widowed spouse. However, there is no haunting, there's no fear, rather just a desperate longing and a desire to be near to the loves gone before her. They both totally adored her. And you know, some would question why she would put herself in position to be grieving again in this season, but we are not her judge and jury. Her memories will serve as her invisible defense attorney. The only thing she is guilty of is she said yes again to love. So that kind of prompted this poem that I call with, and I just probably still in a rough stage, but a with. May we know the power of the with in the face of reality and the difficult what is. Remembering that isolation leads to desolation, it fuels desperation. Sometimes it really is enough to sit quietly and hug our loved ones tightly, hold their hands, listen try to understand and realize that even when we have no answers or solutions and we lack action plans and conclusions, simply offering solidarity seems to provide a level of immunity. Lessons our sense of inequity, even when there is no remedy. The gift of being present connects us at our essence. This clear and certain mystery, connectedness can eclipse a seemingly bottomless abyss. Sharing one another's tears actually has the power to dilute doubts and fears. Somehow the whole is greater than the sum of the parts when we stand together and carry one another's hearts. One more time for Deb. Thank you, Deb. It's been such a joy to watch your poetry uh, continue to bloom. 
So yeah, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm glad that you support us. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> my next uh, um, artist is Dan. Dan is a community promoter. He'll tell you a lot about um, what he does. Um, a lot of times he will highlight a lot of you that have been in the room uh, with your poetry or artwork. Um, so we have uh, definitely connected through the arts and he's been a, a, a huge asset to, to the poetry then helping us get the word out um, as well as helping me do some events. So this is Dan, show some love for Dan too. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I published Panoply Story Art Michiana. It is an online digital arts magazine um, because of uh, my full-time job. I've not published anything uh, over the last quarter, but we're gearing up uh, to publish sometime in January, again, digitally at panoplymichiana.com. Um, there are cards, there's a few cards on the table out there. Uh, this is how we promote the magazine. And there you go. It's a fun thing. We do arts and poetry and short stories and essays. And it's all from people who live in the greater Michigan area. And it's, there's a lot of great stuff that is said and to be seen. Uh, I, it's fun. Um, thank you, Pam. I'm really excited about Poetry Slam and Barge. I haven't been to a Poetry Slam in a long time. They're so cool. Uh, the last time I visited with you, just seems like it was last week or the week before, we were going over reflections as we were doing things. Um, so this, I'm going to start with the one from 1120. So these are things that I've been uh, uh, thinking about as I clean and walk and stuff. Uh, so this is a reflection 1120. Here we stand, flesh and bone, our trial, turmoil, a Pentecost compassion, tongues flaming, speaking the many languages of love. Why do some last a year, some a lifetime, and many less, and many less, naked in our love? This, uh, so I get to a point where I knew that I was going to have to cause change in other people and because that's what I do. And um, it's, I haven't had to do it for a while. So this was a reflection on change. How difficult is it to visit again? Does a rose bush find it hard every spring to create beauty? Does she dread the coming warmth? showers that tell her it is time that's it thank you this is reflection while making chicken soup Eleven twenty-four. how we shape what we love arduous to set aside yourself your opinion your pride make space for the other to grow imagine and thrive we say nothing at all we say things of love. We nod our head. We know what the other means. We think of sacred. We think intentions are for those who can speak the language. Be patient with it. You are my prayer in the morning. Be not afraid. The most precious of spiritual conversions take place in silence. This I wrote today is called Reflection While Vacuuming. So to be glad I didn't write the poem Reflection While Cleaning the Mold Out of the Refrigerator. <laughs> we come to pay our respects at this holy place, make our offering before the priestess. Puppies who begged at the table of our own goddess muse, happy for scraps from the great mother, eager to fetch any sticks thrown, running back with eyes wide. Please, one more time, let me run to your bidding.
Oh, they're calling me. One more time for Dan, please. All right. So we have um, some new people to the Poetry Dan, which I'm super excited about. Uh, BJ is one of them. So we'd like to give a great big round of applause for BJ for being here with us. BJ Woodcox. Uh, my real name is Brandon James Woodcox. So um, tonight I wrote a, I would, I like to think of it as a song, but it's, I heard the song Forever in Love by Kenny G. And uh, this is back in 2015. And it's about four minutes. And I was just like, the saxophone kicks. I'm like, man, there needed to be some words on this. <laughs> So uh, I'm here to tell it to you tonight. And I just finished writing thanks to this very nice civil rights heritage pen here that I totally borrowed there. So I think I'm all set. I think we got the videos vibing, right? Well, I don't know if you see it going. Uh, Listen to Breathless by Kenny G. Girl, I'm never restless when you're next to me. I'm really vibing with your energy. When you entered my brain, stayed th living there rent free. I'm feeling like it was meant to be. You're so classy and we got a lot of chemistry. I've never met a solid 10 in my life, just like me. I'll always take you. <laughs> this is getting started. There's like four other phases. <laughs> I've never met a solid 10. I'll always take you to heights. <laughs> you've always needed to see, you've always meant to see. This could be the romance of the century, like when we're holding hands here on the beach. I'm always thankful for your presence. That's why I'm on my knees. In the chorus, it's like, nah, nah, nah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> hold me closer to you. And then, girl, because I only want to be with you. I want to be so close to you. It's forever. I'm in love with you. Verse two. Still listening to Breathless by Kenny G. I look at you and you're looking back at me. It gets messy when we start to eat that spaghetti. <laughs> but she just say it's funny to watch you eat. She say, you're so silly. Girl, you're a masterpiece. I want to make you say, uh, like Master P. I want you to do <laughs> I want you to know that we can do anything. Sex on the beach, then go hydrate by the sea. Or we could take it back to our crib downtown. Maybe watch a movie and just sit right down. Anything you want, uh, we'll be flying high just like we're in the clouds. And then verse three, now I'm breathless. I cannot breathe because she loves me endless, just like the breeze. I'll keep your secrets locked and then I'll leave the key. Secret phrase at the party, that means it's time to leave. I'm focused on the future and this current moment. You're holding out your hand, just wanting me to hold it. I'll always understand when you know you're over something watching water under the bridge while the river's flowing. Now we're taking new roads, smooth roads, baby, all the way up. I have to say you're always slaying, even with no makeup. I'm always paying close attention to everything you're saying. Your body's like a podcast and I love the conversation. <laughs> this last part here, this one is like, it's still part of the same song. Taking Kokomo trips like Aruba to Jamaica. I've always been a beach boy. <laughs> I've always been a beach boy. I'm about to surf the lake up. <laughs> Here in Michigan, I miss it when you kiss my face, love. And then it's like, there's a whole bunch of other songs. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're always saying, and then that's it. Yeah. So that was Forever in Love by Kenny G. Hold Me Closer. I'm, I'm BJ Woodcox. <laughs> You want this fancy pen? <laughs> sure, they got many. Yeah. <laughs> One more time for BJ, please. Do you guys like such a cool voice? Like I feel I, like I hear it on like late night, you know, late night radio. You know, like smooth talks with us. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Um, let's see. 
Jessica, you want to come next? Jessica's new to the Poetry Den. Please show her some love. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Jessica. And yeah, this is my first time here. Um, this is my very first um, poetry open mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, give it up for my good friend DJ. He's super funny, super funny guy. Um, yeah, so I have a few poems for you guys. Um, this one is titled uh, Three Fours. You're my favorite tree. You're my favorite tree. You're my favorite fairy. You're my favorite flea. You're my favorite tree. You're my favorite sun. You're my favorite cat. You're my favorite gun. I hope it made you laugh. I hope it made you cry. I hope it made you cringe. I hope it made you died. Thank you. Um, this one is titled, Time is Fluid. I love to let time slip away like water down the drain. I think I thought you were thinking about me. And really, I was thinking about you. And really, you were thinking about me. Thank you. Oh man. Um, okay, this one is titled First Poem. This is the first poem I wrote where I felt like I might actually be a poet. Um, I have a misconstrued reality of someone other than just me. I toss and I turn and to no adjourn, these voices just keep calling me. I call out and ask their names and everything remains the same. They are quiet and they are so loud. I want to say goodbye. And I just don't know how. Uh, all right, so I'm going to end with this. This is a pretty recent poem. Um, I wrote it this past week. Uh, it's called The Unfolding. Find me in the unfolding where the past is just beginning, where the witches are ever trolling. It's the unfolding where you can find me in the unfolding where the present is just winning, where the witches are ever spinning, it's the beginning of the unfolding, where the future is just pining, where the witches are never whining, it's the shining of the unfolding. I'm not joking, I'm rather quite serious. I, <laughs> I hope you enjoy your journey. Please forlorn me 
hand me a pass no words it's all in the unfolding thank you thank you All right, let's show some love for Jessica, our first time reading. It's always nice to have people come out of the shell and come up here and let loose and learn from everybody else and get the support. So I'm glad you both are here. Thank you for being here with us. And let you want to, you want to do, you want to set up now? Get set you up. Okay, let me um first let's show some love for Anne. We got to do a little uh setup and while we're doing that, she's gonna um do some disclaimers uh for you all. Okay, so mine is probably one of the only ones that's gonna need to come with a trigger warning. So I am issuing both a trigger warning and a child warning now for anybody listening. The content's not child friendly. If you're out there, you might wanna put me on mute or put on your headphones. Um, the content warning is this. Brene Brown once said, you either walk inside your story and own it or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. With that in mind, I'm gonna do two things. I'm going to play you an audio clip from 2016 of spoken word poetry that I submitted for an international amnesty event when I was in law school. The proceeds designed to raise awareness for a global anti-human trafficking like entity. I am then going to follow that with a similar updated poem that I will read out loud called Dear John. It's gonna take me about six minutes to get through both. So to anyone who may have child trauma or trafficking trauma, this is your warning now that this is going to be a journey. And for those of you who are willing to stick with me through this, I appreciate it because I think both of these are meant to be heard together. It is. Your face, feel your breath. I taste your taste. I close my eyes and try to breathe. The rush of you washes over me. The grin on my face that speaks to my soul. Your unshakable faith, I'd never let go. Locked in a cage in a world of red, sleeping against bars, seduced in beds. A life of prostitution, shame, disgrace. I wasn't 20, I was only eight. Ragged hands and bloodshot eyes, oozy breath, claiming the divine. Broken promises, jewelry and toys, forced to play with men and boys. I see you when I try to sleep. I see them there and then I weep. Countless tears shattered on my floor. Countless hours behind closed doors. Therapist bills I can't afford to repay just to prove I won't kill myself today. But it doesn't happen, never here. Human trafficking is nowhere near. Maybe in Africa where there is war, maybe in slums to some kind of core, maybe to women who can't consent, maybe to adults who just won't repent, but never here to our children dear and never in our social sphere, but the memories of the scar on my face, the floor, my crate. I wasn't 20, I was only eight. Dear John, if I could paint landscape with words, I would write you a letter, a poetic elocution to my greatest oppressor. I would find you in jail and sit you down to read the words I wish to say at your parole hearing. 
If you were still alive, maybe I could finally ask why, when at four years old, I watched a little girl die. Senseless gun tragedy in your theater of violence, her blood on my hands, a gasp followed by silence. If I had been bigger, I could have stopped you right there, but it was never in you, was it, to make a fight that is fair. As many guards as children in your human trafficking front, you hid violence behind religion, a dogmatic stunt. Your initials branded on my knee, I should get on them and pray because you're the closest thing to God I still get to to this day. The amount of my purchase tattooed on my hand, the cost of my freedom, simple supply and demand, the mark on my face so people know where to return, daddy's little girl and your biggest concern. Because souls like me bend, but we do not break. Not at eight years old, not for death or for rape. We rise in revolt and we get out with violence. Well, you can't call the police, so it's met with silence. Your house of card people fell one player at a time. What was your greatest fall from grace was my biggest climb. Child protective hearings and prosecutors abound all to make sure I could testify without you around. But it would take years for me not to see you when I sleep and years even longer before I could think of her and not weep. But you died long before I could ever say, you never truly won that day. I may have been down and out, broken it seemed, but welling in my chest, my breath, a primal scream. Where my childhood laid, a new life was created, an advocate born while my future self waited, making sense of your senseless tragedy while joining a very ethereal tapestry of people with convictions forged in fire, people not from the world, but of it that inspire, the people who move and shake and build, people with whom their honed words are skilled. Because you had my body, and took away my choice. You took away my freedoms, but never my voice. You left marks on my body, my doctor struggled to remove, and you left me with a soul that was battered and bruised. But broken bones heal and come back twice as strong. And as long as there's been slavery, there's also been song. So you held me captive just as long as I needed. To pick up this mantle, I will run with unheeded. Because that that doesn't break could only ever be bent. When hell's already rained fire, it must be heaven sent. So I live in the divine with a mind and soul unbound. My soul braced and ready, reverberating an ancient sound. So call me a doctor, a king, a disabled blind leader. Call me a reverend, a lyricist, one of the world's greatest thinkers. Because many souls have passed with a voice that remains clear. It must end now, this injustice ends here. And so I'm stepping into the shoes of the visionaries before me because I have the power of a voice and a story. So I wish I could see you in your jail cell now or sit at your grave and explain this somehow. But like all great tragedies, you were laid to rest, existing only as a memory now within my hollowed out chest. But if I realized I could say, I hate you breaking me in a breath, it would only be to thank you for making me with my next. So as I move forward, please know this is goodbye because we have sat together long enough, your ghost and I. I am setting the weight of us down to pick up the collective weight of oppression, no longer fighting with hands bound or my voice meeting your suppression. This fight is bigger than us, so consider this my goodbye because while your life may have ended, I have finally arrived. Man, super powerful. Man. Thank you for that. One more time for. Uh, the one thing that I love about the poetry, then, is that there's so many things that 
uh, get shared here and um, the fact that the voices get heard here. Um, and I'm sure it has a lot to do with um, why this building is still here and what it stands for. So um, I'm appreciative of that and what you bring, what others bring. Um, we bring the laughter, we bring the seriousness, we bring the tears, we bring the anger, we bring it all, we bring it all here and let it out. And that's, it's awesome, it's a beautiful thing. So I'm gonna go online with Lori if she's ready. I did text you, George, but you, you were focused. Hi, how are you? Hey. Show some love for Lori, please. Hi, hey, everybody. Since um, this year has been quite challenging, I'm actually going to take a little trip back to a more, I guess, a less complicated time. So I'm getting my poems here. And this one is kind of abstract and whimsical. This is I wrote in 2000. Winter monsters blow, blue moon fluff beneath cool shadow dream. I think that was from a dream and I painted something about it. So again, it was winter monsters blow, blue moon fluff be beneath cool shadow dream. And here's one about a snowman that was built in my neighborhood. Snowbuddy. I met somebody named Snowbuddy in my boulevard. He's silent and unshowy, and people may say he's nobody, but I'm sure he's Snowbuddy. I know he's somebody. This was another one called Snowy Day. Snowy day feels like a holiday. Wish it could stay that way, freeze in time like yesterday, so we could go out and play on a fun and frosty snowy day. Just a couple more. This one is called Winter Songs. It's a short version. I heard the songs of winter cooing outside the door Whispering winds are twirling, dancing with the snow. And this last one is called Enlightenment. One winter, I fell in love. Snow seemed pure rather than intrusive. I succumbed to your silence and your cold, icy attitude. And even as I scrape your frost off my windshield, winter season rests near my new winter spirit. Thank you for letting me share tonight. Thank you, Lori. One more time for Lori. Thank you. Um, I'm very appreciative of her. She's been with us for a long time and um, is through all of the things that she's been through this year. I'm glad that she's coming out on top. Thank and you. I appreciate all the, the love that she continues to share with me. Um, I follow her on Facebook, so I kind of see and we, we chat a lot. And um, she's always ready and available to give to help us with the poetry then. So um, again, I'm appreciative of you. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Love you all. <laughs> yeah. All right. EJ. Yeah. You got that fancy new book. <laughs> I, I left my, uh, my actual book that I write my stuff in at home today, but I had bits, bits and pieces of one on my phone and I kind of took a little minute to put it all together. So um, I've learned a lot from coming here now for what, five, six months mm -hmm. when I started coming here. And it's just been like a, it's been a journey listening to you poets and learning from your cadences and tempos and humor and wit and, and just lyrical. I mean, just the way you can paint a tapestry of words together. So I've 
tried to work on my rhythm and uh, this one is about meditation. So let me take you on a journey of my meditation. Peace. A peace of mind while trying to find. I can't align in peaceful meditation. Hold a thought, focus, strain. Follow the train, don't complain. Am I doing it right? I'm going insane. In a world of distraction, it's hard to gain mental traction. Ground into the ground. It can't be found like a blue tick hound. My thoughts are wound like a tornado. Hold the space, outer space to my inner place. My mind's a race to find my place in the holy space called meditation. Peace, full stop. Let the beat drop. My heart stops from the bottom to the top. Forget the slop, clean the house and mop. Peace. Back to the start. Be still, my heart. A world apart, I'm off the chart, add one to the cart and check out. Realize it's all in my head. No more to dread. I've got soul bread, a better talk than Ted. With that, the rest is unsaid. Peace. Show some love for EJ again. Uh, what I love about uh, poetry, me and my friend, when we first started out, uh, we had lots of conversations about like, you know, um, you know, you hear somebody and you kind of want to like mimic them and then you're mad because you can't really feel that. And I've always said to her that we got to be ourselves. So we, we write how we, we get inspired by people and you write the way that you do best. You do you best. So I've always wanted to be a, a poet that ran that read long poems. I don't write long poems. So, you know, why struggle over that? Just do what I do and do that well. So I always encourage that. Um, uh, find your find your voice and go with it and people will love it. You'll, you'll find out they love it. Uh, so I appreciate you, EJ, for being here and, and hanging out with us and sucking it all in and giving us more. Pat. Come on down, sister girl. <laughs> yeah, you will. Let me adjust to the cold slowly. I lived in Florida for 22 years now, back in the Midwest. And I love the snow. I love the falls. But I'll be damned if I love this cold. <laughs> Um, I'm going to write, read an old poem I wrote. These times we like to think about happy times and we like to think about family, but I also remember those times when life was not exactly happy, when I was a young person struggling. And this was a poem I wrote, it's called, I Wanted to Write. I wanted to write a love poem, but a few quick fucks ain't exactly love. <laughs> so I started to write a beautiful poem about the stillness of the night, except that bitch downstairs is screaming cause her old man is kicking ass again. Guess I'll write a poem about the gracefulness of a rat running across a moonlit street. One of the nice things about getting older is that you see life a little differently. This one is called Autumn and it's dedicated to all of my aunties who are no longer with me. She sits like a fragile leaf crushed by autumn winds head nodding rhythmically to almost forgotten tunes, lifelines etched deeply, tracing ancient paths of smiles and tears. She sits 
eyes haunted with fading memories, hands resting on a battered black book filled with dying dreams. She sits fragile like a dry leaf crushed by autumn winds. Thank you, Pat. Um, Pat is usually my voice of reason a lot. She's very, she's very genuine and authentic. Seriously, if you ever get a chance to talk to her, she's not gonna like, you know, she's not mean, but she's just very, she's very sincere. She is, and she's she's whipped me into some shapes that she didn't know, uh, and helped me realize. So, so I really, really appreciate you. And she's a very integral part of uh, the poetry dance. So. Yeah, appreciate you and Merry Christmas. Emerson, yeah, come on down. Okay, so I'm sorry I'm late. I want you all to know that I fell asleep on my couch after church and woke up and thought it was tomorrow. And that's like the worst thing. Um, I jumped in my car. And then uh, those of you who have been to my house know that I have an obsession with furniture I found on the side of the road. And I found this beautiful desk while I was en route here. So I had to pull over and put it in my car, um, which made me even later, but it's beautiful and real wood and like, wow. So if you wanna go see it later, you can. Um, okay, this may or may not be finished but we're gonna try it's on my phone and then I actually prepared one on paper which is how I like to do things paper okay this is about like a weird dream that I had and um I decided I should write it down when I woke up at around three in the morning uh it's called stone parachute there was a temple one could visit each night it climbed into the sky silt and stone ash and bone all that went into building this ancient emblem of a god knowable it climbed and swooped and reached at last a resting place upon a precipice, the journey treacherous, but still we clung and abided, stayed inside the temple walls as if the stone would protect us in a fall. And it did, though upon the journey we wondered at each turn or dive, will this be my demise? Riding in stone castles that can rise and writhe and fly is not for the faint of heart. And alas, too many uninitiated entered those who came for curiosity or seeking to sati satiate others' animosity, but not guided by love. As faint hearts fell off, mine clung. How the castle climbed up through the sky like a parcel of Roman forum lifted, parting from the dirt and grass, holding pillars gifted to the gods of another time, bounding above plateaued peaks with double back paths to a place no shadows can be cast beyond the rising pillars that looked like beams of sun in photographs. It was as if a parcel of history shirked the earth and climbed the sky for a mighty visit to its ancient friend, Ac Acropolis. I adventure to and through these heightened monuments of stone <clears throat> extracted from the same quarry, longing to be reunited. A query ignites, how many eons have they been together, stone from stone before parted? Do their atoms still commune, quantumly entangled, same stone with same stone, formed millennia before Rome ever set foot on distant lands, my fingertips connecting that which cannot touch. When I walked this path, I carried the dust, like in the painting in which the lovers look out at us, pleasing, look now to my lover and connect our gaze, for we cannot be together, but you can unite us through some mystic majesty, let our love be mythical, if not merciful or merry. I'm getting a text, sorry. <laughs> Is this the way with God, the sun, quantumly entangled light from light? When I first walked Athenian paths, I wondered, will others a thousand years hence think of my God like this, believing such does not exist? There will come a time when universe's expansive velocity has carried the glorious clouds of gas and dust to a distance the future's telescopes can't see. And those future dwellers may be given to believing this universe is lonely, wondering about what we wrote down and passed along 
thinking it was we who were unrelentingly wrong, doubting our ability to discern with the precision that they'd learned. It feels like that, that melancholic menacing, losing pieces of reality, touting unreliable methodology for establishing a narrative behind the happenings perceived. Sometimes even I am deceived by false narratives for much is indiscernible by imperfect instruments and pain oft inspires stories untrue. Oh, the stories that I tell myself when suffering indwells, not always or even often the one the spirit says to speak. My own eye is deceived by the daytime sky, yet I never forget the stars exist. Why can my faith not be like this? In my dream it is, while steer, still near enough to earth, my ancient shelter lurched and swerved and set some back on solid ground. For only those with star-crossed faith can ride this tumultuous wave. And so I rode up, up higher still, and hold the whole temple left from under me, and I held with certitude to a stone parachute. I tried to save my friends and had to realize over again that I am not alone responsible for them. What kind of God is this I claim above if I do not trust such a God with those I love? I long to trust, though for a time I held some with my own strength, strength saving them, I believed, from certain death. I learned to release them, my muscles untensed. Then came the ebb of ache, the subsiding shake, a, rest, a restoration from weariness for lack of strength, for a task relinquished. And my loves did not crash and crumble into dirt. Once I released, they could be guided by another force back down to earth and choose to walk along the path the force begat or go another way, still guided, such choices. Is the strength for faith merely avoidance of fatigue from unrequited decision upon decision, preservation of energies for more meaningful contemplation? Must we not be bothered by clothes like birds so our souls can be tuned instead to what the spirit asks of us? Moment by moment, a communal mending, connection or solitude, spurning to solicitude, I must be reminded repeatedly. Endurance was developed not to imbue importance to that which isn't, but to hold with certitude to stone parachutes as in a dream. And often spirits speak silently, beckoning us to remember what we already know, give head and heart to messages written a thousand years before our time and a thousand years before that still, rely not on our imperfect instruments, reporting at times with telescopic accuracy that this universe is void. I continue to believe in stars amid my glare distorted vision. That stone parachute. <laughs> Okay, this one's short and sweet. And then I have a happy one. I rarely write happy poems. Um, all right, I don't know what this is called. Um, Lean into the warm, we're told, but so much of life is cold. Hollow aching echoes of what life was, life was meant to hold, or on the other hand, far from even echoes of what was meant to be, far from the beauty that was breathed into being. The life and limb brought forth from dust, atoms spinning and assembling. What was that divine initiator envisioning? For this feels far flung from any vision a Holy Spirit would have spun, spiraling through unknowable space, pleading with time to tell us why. Even science can't comprehend the mysteries uncovered. Atoms unraveled yield a smaller universe still. And no response beyond trust can touch the taste of these tears spilled. The end. Okay, this one's more happy. Um, this is like a spinoff of Twas the Night Before Christmas. I wrote it for my kiddos. I'm probably going to cry, but it's supposed to be happy. Anyway, here we go. Uh, Tis the season of Christmas, so together we snuggle as the sky outside dances with wintry weather. We're warm in these walls. When we scooch close and cuddle, our hearts are at peace and our limbs are a jumble. Outside of each window, snowflakes take their shape while moonbeams bounce brightly off the white winterscape. Lights hang through the house, a twinkle like flames, while our mom tells the story of Mary with babe. 
We listen and linger, we lean in for more and ask for the stories of when we too were born. So she retells the story of each of us three and says, I'm so lucky to be your mommy. She reminds us our names and how each came to be. And we talk about Jesus and what God's names all mean. Emmanuel and Prince of Peace, Elohim, our God Almighty, El Roy, the God who sees, and a part of us knows that's the reason for glee. As if with wings, mommy wraps us up. She tells of God protecting us, El Shaddai, who's strong enough that we can rest in love and trust. And that helps us trust, or try at least, like the ones who said yes to the first Christmas Eve, the ones who said yes to the risks they were taking, yes to the weariness, wondering, waiting, those rebels embracing mysteries that abound, God turning almost everything upside down. And we wild-eyed wondered of those first Christmas scenes and all of the mystery and what it all means. A mom with a babe nursing cuddly and cozy paradox of a father who may have felt lonely. Unlikely revelation with a quiet unfolding, a baby-sized mystery mom and dad were both holding. This double adoption no words could define of, Joseph, of Jesus by Joseph and divine calling us mine. A star hung from heaven, plucked out of time, so all those who sought could that Christ child find. Angelic messengers bringing fear, calm, then thrill. Shepherds with sheep asleep on a hill. And all of those hosts with their heavenly singing across desert sojourn, the gifts they were bringing. And speaking of gifts, mommy says with a smile, time to enjoy the gift of sleep for a while. Our tired eyes droop, our hearts full with wonder, we make our way into bed and off into slumber. Dazzling dreams fill our heads of the beautiful daring of the very first Christmas, such spectacular caring. Be at peace, my sweet babe, mommy says to us each, whispering quietly into our sleep. And she says one more thing as she turns out each light. Merry Christmas, my love, sweet dreams, and good night. That was very sweet. One more time for Emerson. I think I got everybody, yeah? Uh, so I'm gonna share this, this one poem just to um, um, reiterate that we are doing a poetry slam and then we're gonna uh, move forward with our featured artists. Um, this poem that I wrote is a favorite of mine. A lot of you have heard it before, um, but uh, with the, the recent, um, news about Twitch, who was on the Ellen Show. This poem I wrote called Life and Its Complexity, I wrote at the same time that Robin Williams uh, uh, took his life as well. <clears throat> and as a person, as a person, a young person who dealt with the same kind of, um, you know, life is just too rough and you want to just be, be rid of it all, um, those, these kind of things um, set differently in me and as the season you know comes about you know there's beautiful I've had beautiful Christmases with friends and family but I also know that um, there's a lot of people that you know hurt a little extra during these times so if we can remember them but this piece was called life and its complexity I actually did it during um, a slam and so it'll give you a kind of taste of kind of like how that goes <clears throat> A blind man's canvas does not stereotype in color. It absorbs each tone with a brushstroke, one after another after another, until it creates unity, unity that comes with sincerity, a place for clarity and solidarity, intertwined with grace, a different perspective of reality and race. And this race is so fast paced, dreams have been shuffled into how I get my next hustle, while money has become the new international version of the gospel. My mama always said, everything that glitters ain't gold and Lord knows why suicide resides in those that make people laugh for a living. While depression inside creates a lynching. Life in its complexity, truth in its infidelity, justice in its immorality, Christianity in its popularity and peace. 
Peace has no amount of gratuity, but then there's love. The phantom in my opera, the beauty in my beast, who sings the sound of music only dream girls see. While raising in the sun, I got smoke in thoughts, gunpowder on my lips, words like bullets interject these lyrical rhymes into open minds and anyone who might be spiritually inclined to hear me. The two most important times in life, the day you were born and the day you figured out why. At least that's what Mark Twain said. And it made real good sense in my head, so why not share? But at the end of the day, the sun will reach its hand out to the moon. Ocean's waves will dance to an orchestra's tune. Seashells will come ashore as the Sandman prepares to confess his love once more until she stays in life's complexity. So you'll see a lot of some of that kind of um, poetry when we do the slam. Um, it's not, you don't have to memorize, you can read from paper as well. So um, <laughs> these, are, these are the things that I've challenged myself with. Um, but I'm really excited that um, Stephanie is here with us to be our featured artist. Um, I contacted her probably months ago and so I'm glad that she remembered and still. <laughs> and still said yes. Usually I don't contact people until a month before and say, hey, you still with me? Um, but she said yes, and she traveled here from Benton Harbor to be, Benton Harbor, right? Yes, to be here. How do you say your last name, Erdman? Okay. Uh, so these are, these are my fun, these, these are my fun times when I get to read the bio. I say, yeah, send me a bio. And then I go, <laughs> no, no, was, yeah, so. Uh, Stephanie was born in Fruitdale, Indiana, and growing up in Indianapolis, Stephanie graduated from Purdue University and received her master's degree through Indiana University, South Bend. Her first poetry collection based on her graduate thesis, which is Piranha. Yeah, the one that she has uh, uh, displayed on the table and you can also purchase tonight. Uh, it's available through Das Madras Press. And her second collection, how do you say that, San? Sankara. Sankara. No, it's okay. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's upcoming from Urban Farmhouse Press, focuses on the Buddhist cycles of becoming. It seeks to tell the story of grief and of the mortification of worldviews into self-realization. While much of her poetry is self-reflective, Stephanie describes her style as anything with music and novelty. She is very much a poet from and of the Midwest, but her poetry attempts to capture the universal views, moments and feelings that are common to most everywhere. She writes about Indianapolis and Nashville and Indiana, and Washington State and South Bend and Detroit and the Lakeshore and Chicago, but conceding the feeling that these places could be anywhere. Soon, sad face, to re relocate, that means, yeah, to relocate to Southwest Georgia, Stephanie works as a professor of English, editor, and professional tutor. She lives in Benton Harbor, Michigan with her dog, cat, and persistent imposter syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> if you all could please show some real good love for Stephanie as she presents the love. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here tonight, Pam. Um, I was, I'm gonna be honest, I was kind of hoping this wouldn't come together because this is like now <laughs> making it really official that I have to say goodbye to all of my local creative community. And it kind of hurts my soul a little bit. I mean, Dan's here. I've, I've participated with Panoply multiple times. Um, I've been with the Poetry Den almost the entire time I've lived here. And this is the closing of, 15 years in residence in the area. Um, but I have dental insurance now. So um, so there is that. Um, so yeah, um, 
I am actually headed to Georgia January 3rd. So this is sort of my last hurrah. Um, all right, and as Pam mentioned, I do have some copies of Pyronic. Um, at this point, y'all would be doing me a favor. It's less shit to move. <laughs> um, so tonight and tonight only, they're going either for my cost $10 or a donation and a handshake because I still have a damn case of them. Okay. Pardon my language. All right. Um, and I'm going to start with the very first poem in the book uh, titled Celebrating What I Forgot. The sky scraping against itself and steel wool surging toward making it rain today. We apply ourselves indigently to neat bourbons. This is how we celebrate the South and count down toward the julep months, our muddlers in our mouths and not speaking to one another. I don't fold up elegantly any more expansive with age and weariness, cotton tongued at 1 a.m. In, in the basket of your grown up tricycle. And I am terrible with time. So if I start to bore you all, just like start waving your hands or making choking motions, it's fine. Um, also from Pyronic, I still live. And this is written after the passing of the man who called himself the world's most unfamous artist. Born enamored with the sea and light and all that it reflects off of, the surfaces that were familiar until the sunset, until the broken glass settled against our tongues and the roofs of our mouths, prayer room silent. There were ululations over the desert that settled into the wombs of cactus blossoms, small oases in the vast unforgiven. Her name was something like a stream that I can't remember and she yelled back at our echoes, do not fill us yet, we are still alive. We waited for the acerb air to mummify us somewhat. And I remember hearing about caves, the crystal dormant in them and dry, the water seeping toward the chambers for 10,000 years. I promise they're not all sad. Some of them are angry, so I do have rain. <clears throat> On that note, um, Jeremiah 18.4, this is a poem I actually wrote after the death of Muhammad Ali. So, Jeremiah 18.4, there was a man glowing like a house upon the hill. We took pictures of him only when he bled, clenched hands raised like a house upon the hill. We spoke his name when he bled, clenched hands raised, the lights all on until they weren't. We spoke his name, you are the most important. The lights all on until they weren't to build a realm extending to you are the most important and limited by the horizons, a built realm extended to as far as you can see. I guess this one's a little happier. I mean, unless you remember that it was written for my ex-husband. <laughs> There was something I wanted to tell you, something on my tongue like ghost peppers and nutmeg. I wanted to ask you where all the deer went in hunting season, whether they can see all the safety orange and know to stay off the roads. I wanted to ask you if you can feel how we're all pierced by starlight and how there are miles of asphalt run under our palms as we grow older. There was something important that I meant to write down, some perfect words that were like an incantation for beauty that I wanted to roll around in my mouth for a while and share with you. I wanted to make music with you, but my fingers are blunt and stubborn. I broke the metal one, you remember? It looks like a lightning rod now, like the tip is on sideways, like oak trees look in winter when they're naked, remember? I meant to write something for you, a slip of paper with a password so I'd recognize you when you come home and my mind is fuzzy from being elsewhere. Not that I stop knowing you when I go. I'm just less me every time I come back, you see. I meant to leave this chair today. I meant to do something important, but I forgot what the word was. I wanted to tell you about how it's only wonderful when you drive me places, how I wouldn't trust anyone else quite as completely in my shitty car. Even though we, you talk with your hands when you're excited and we stagger between lanes and laugh when we're silent, remember? I wanted to remember how the sky seems to pool in the blue holes over the flat places in Michigan, like it remembers at night how hayfields look stubbled in lopseed each summer. Excerpt from a love letter 
February 15th, 2015. Oh. And to finish that out, you told me once my smile was like snagging salmon, slick and off-putting, so I stopped. I stopped singing because you told me that I sounded raw, my syllables too vegan. I stepped sideways around our bed, sheet barriers, and carefully pick my hair out of your dinner, stay up late erasing my shadows. If I prayed, it would be just becoming a pillar of salt. I roll your sleeping pills between my calloused fingertips and wait, dampen paroxysms and clamped teeth to not interject your dreams. At night, I imagine the sun on corpse flowers and gull wings. In the day, I wait for the moon in the beaks of the gar. They are the vicious river. I run deep in the muck dug river, the flots of medical waste and paper pulp bleach. I want to rest with fish rot on the lily pads, a tail only a freshwater mermaid would have, like a steelhead's or a cotton mouth. In the humid morning, my head is wreathed with cottonwood silk. My cheeks are red like windburn, and one of my eyelids droops. The more I look like my mother, the less you watch my mouth waiting to interrupt my droning words. Excerpt from an argument, July 2014. <laughs> Um, do we still have a few minutes? Okay. Um, because I wanted to move on from some stuff from the new book. Um, so the first of these is called agogi, which is actually the Greek word for the training regimen that was given to all Spartan children. Um, the process of separating from them from their mothers and um, training them to be citizens of a very warlike realm. Agoji, you fledgling as the ground wings itself to meet you. Suddenly home is hostile. Fear is the other side of love, you see, and strength the sunward side of sadness. Fend off the night, hold back the dark. Forget for now your mother's face. Grip tight, bright becoming, bleed, virgin. Spread your atavistic wings, curse her name, for now, hate her will, her secret sadness, hold her scars. Hers, the softness in you that wasn't named or known before. Your cenote soul near the surface, bend steel to you and banish the open spaces. Barter your desires against death itself. Tattoo her name over your missing rib. Marvel at the knitted new muscle that ca cages each new breath. Find your home when finally you can grasp your place. Oh, and this is actually, so this is about, if any of you all have been to Berrien Springs, the bridge that goes over the river. So that area used to be a public dump. And if you go walk along the river, not on the fisherman's side, the other side, you find all sorts of really old, really cool shit, like glass bottles and like old prescription bottles and silverware and old plates and stuff. Um, so this is about that place. Remnants, delicately like stirring milk into tea, fading sepia photographs in the sunlight of solemn faced women and their deftly wound tresses. You dip your pinky into my navel as if testing for fit. I am the night owl and the snow crested mask of mine. We are warbling thrushes singing in the round. We are spilled milk and window glass rinsed around along the riverbed. Remember how the banks had shards like pebbles? I found a whole ink well there. When we were constantly casting the currents, we didn't bring the lead for conquering. The fish were jumping and I tucked the clear vessel into my pocket. I wanted to save something in it. Okay. All right, um, this one's a little hard for me to read. Um, it's not been a good year for me. A lot of transitions, some of which I didn't sign up for. Y'all know the mood. Yeah. Okay. I'll forget what you look like again soon. And I don't ask a picture of you. I am practicing letting you go this way. 
meditating on the cold fading of your face, practicing falling out of love with your right ear, falling out of love with the scar in your eyebrow, the goddamn blue green of your eyes. When I'm fluent, I'll fall out of love with the mellow blister of your voice and the elision of your fingers, the frantic pace of your breathing, the envelope of your body, the pockets I sneak myself into. I didn't memorize you today. I didn't look back. I know there are new constellations in your gaze, not for me, but I map them. I stole the planets of you with my palms, the orbits of you with my teeth. I'll fly home with your scent on me, then I'll wash it off. Um, so most of the new book came out of quarantine. Um, it was a big period of transition. I am actually the recipient of the very first Zoom divorce in the state of Michigan. <laughs> Y'all are welcome. We pioneered that shit. Um, took two minutes. It was great. Um, so most of these pieces were written in my studio basement apartment in the scariest part of Mishawaka um, as I tried to figure out what next. Um, and this was part of that process. How to be alone. Step one get naked. Don't be naked. Get naked like you would if someone were watching slowly, uncomfortably. Acknowledge the artificiality of the act. Now be naked. Just be. Be with it. Embrace it. Get comfortable. Step two, flay yourself. This is not a metaphor. Find a knife, sharpen a fucking shell, get to it. Curl the tips of your fingers, feel the subdermis and the adipose slip. Peel back, ignore the sear of the exposed nerve endings, roll your skin neatly, set it aside, <clears throat> embrace this. Step three, look at yourself wrapped in bleeding squamous cells, except there is nothing beautiful left. Step four, Unzip yourself along the ventral seam, down your trachea, the sternum, solar plexus, untie your abdomen, and shrug your naked torso out of its meat. <clears throat> you are open like a jacket in the late spring, disordered like the remains of a meal. Fall in love with this. Step five, inventory your own organs. Lift them out of their visceral pockets, inspect them, your lobed lungs and liver, your mechanical and organic heart, valved and chambered, the forgettable spleen and gallbladder, your vestigial appendix, kidneys and their adrenal caps, vacuous stomach, delicate bowels like earthworms, easily punctured, the urinary bladder, your internal sex, so many organs are just bags to fill with waste. Set these aside gently, remember their order. You are empty. This is vulnerability that you can be so quickly unfilled. Step six, trace the interior sides of your skeleton, the unexplored angles of it, both framework and cage. Mm. Do I have anything more hopeful? <laughs> Um, so this is actually from a series in the book titled The Body Series. I've read some of these here before. Um, along with my exploration of sort of like my place in the world um, was also confronting mm -hmm. that my body was made by drunken idiots and is absolute falling apart rickety shit. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to explore what it was to be with that reality um, to sort of acknowledge the fact that, you know, I don't work so good. Um, so this was part of that process and trying to see that in like a new and slightly more positive light. The body as a seeded cloud with the soil dry, life crying out for itself, longing to see its own face reflected bright and silver and irrepressible. A pull programmed into neurochemicals, iodide impregnated with the flaws of ionized silver, the sparkle in its yellow body previously pure expanded cage of its crystals like the promise of hexagonal snowflakes, a whole stratum of convective clouds with open bellies dry in their latent heat and just waking. 
In carefully planned vectors, the flares fall downwind, carried upward, they sudden, the sudden pull of updrafts and resulting rapid growth. Human sacrifice licked obsidian blades of hope for some seasonal abundance. And the biological imperative to knit the tissue of new worlds, organic vapors pang in dissipation. All right, I've got two yet, but one of them short. An entire autumn in your gaze sometimes leaves burning along the curved roads to nowhere. The hunger for a place in an illustrated atlas between my thighs, the coordinates you sip from my open mouth to paint across the abraded edges of me. The end of season wanderlust you keep, even after you breathe it into me. I'll carry these deep cuts. I'll trace your name over and over like I believe it will bridge, renumber, unnumber the miles, sing you under my breath like a spell, some incantation for the shape of you. That I can be forgiven for building this narrative. I'll write letters to you in paradise, ones that if I send them, you'll discard unopened. We can both see the sublime in that. In paradise, you whisper my name to trees and plant the twisted vine of me in some weedy perennial bed. Curate, cultivate, and preserve the greenness in me. Claim and reclaim these little dampened deaths of mine. Sing me the love song of myself. The immoderate texture of your hands, the microscopic tremors and fine muscles you've schooled in gentleness. Split me open anyway, because here I cannot claim your patient nature. Ask me anything. Give me a mark to remember you by. Make me, make that mark my name. I'll wear liar's brands everywhere you've touched. You didn't have to kiss me after to touch my soul and hurts, to name the face of my regrets distant because I can't bring your face to mind. But I recall the pith of your skin, the taste of you, the demon timbre in your voice, the smell of sleeping earth in you. Tell me the gods of your philosophies, the shifting histories of morality, the desperate flavor of power. Paradise, you tell me, is the mountains, the unbound sky where the earth lets her hair down and loves us again closely the way we think we deserve. All right, last one, I swear. Leaning north. Toward your forest heart, forget me last because I can't think of another wish. This deep land, our wrists tattooed together, a smiling, dark haired girl leans against your stepside truck in a dream from 20 years ago, before we were young together, before the grapevines, before the dunes behind us. Don't forget me because the moon is so near, because our luggage is mingled. I've been forgotten before. Thank you all for your patience. Thank you so much, Stephanie. One more big round of applause for her. Um, all the, the best for you and your, your new um, adventures. Dental insurance, smiling a little harder. I hope that you'll keep us uh, in your hearts and you know visit us you know whether it's virtually or if you come back to visit stop through we appreciate you and all that you've contributed to the poetry den um this concludes our uh 2022 poetry den glad you all are here um thank you for enduring these lights i um I have uh, some of my colleagues from work that are here. Appreciate you guys being here. I was going to wear this to our Christmas party, but I decided not to. And as soon as I got out of the car, I was meeting George and George's like, are those Christmas lights? <laughs> here I thought I was being super festive and he just like took the pin and put it in the blue. <laughs> um, I hope you all, and you know, uh, I don't know what people's paths are and, and how the holidays set with you, but I hope that there is some joy, there is some peace, whatever you plan to do, whoever you plan to be with. Um, yeah, so I'm wishing you all the best, all the best vibes, prayers, everything. Um, and glad that you were here with us. Hope to see you um, next year. Remember that we are doing a slam. We need we need people to be in the audience. So whether you're participating or not, we need you to be in the audience. 
There is some flyers to take with you for a reminder. There are some free notepads out there. Um, but yeah, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Thank you again. Yeah. And we'll see you next year.